everybody, your old pal Jeff Urban here, speaking to you from the Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum. We've got some sort of somber lighting and set design here today because we're talking about a very somber uh, event. <clears throat> it was on this day 78 years ago, April 12, 1945, that Franklin D. Roosevelt, 32nd President of the United States, uh, died of a cerebral hemorrhage at uh, Warm Springs, Georgia, in his little White House cottage uh, down there at about 3.35 Eastern wartime. That was the official time uh, of death that was listed uh, on his uh, Georgia State death certificate, which I'll show you in just a second. But the events that were leading up to and following that are what we're here to talk about uh, today. So Franklin Roosevelt was elected in 1932, and he uh, took office in March of 1933. It was a landslide election over his opponent, Herbert Hoover, and he took power at a time when things were really not so good here in the country. In fact, it was the height of the Great Depression. The uh, unemployment rate had soared to 25%. It was much higher in some areas and in some industries. There was 25% underemployment. Uh, banks were and farms were failing at about 1,000 a month. The suicide rate had tripled over four years, and the country was entering its sixth or seventh year of a major drought. And yet Roosevelt stood up there on the Capitol and uh, took the oath of office. And then he told everybody that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And uh, the country believed him and things began to change. He went on to win re-election in 1936, 1940, 1944. And during his 12 years as president, he would create over 40 governmental programs collectively known as the New Deal. And uh, he would um, reassure the country through 31 fireside chats about conditions that were going on in the country and in the world. He conducted 998 press conferences, and he led us through the awful times of the Great Depression and the Second World War, defeating Adolf Hitler, ushering in the atomic age, and creating the United Nations. This guy got a lot of stuff done. He broke political precedent after uh, political precedent and political traditions over and over again. He was the first disabled president to serve uh, here in the country. He was the first candidate to fly to and accept the nomination uh, of his party at the actual convention. He was the first president to appoint a woman to the cabinet. Uh, he was also the first president to have unscripted press conferences and the first president to appear on television. It was experimental then in 1939, the World's Fair, but nonetheless, he was the first. He was also the first to run for a third and a fourth term and be elected to both of those, uh, those uh, re-elections. So Roosevelt seemed to be everywhere uh, back in the day, and he was um, one of those presidents that was sort of in our living room, not in our face. Uh, he appeared to us uh, in newsreels. He, uh, came to us over the radio, and people felt a real connection uh, with President Roosevelt. So his death on uh, April 12, 1945, shocked the nation and the world. He had been president for so long that some people couldn't remember a time when he hadn't been president. And many people around the country and around the world wondered out loud, what happens now? Where do we go from here? How do we go on? Who will, who can? fill this giant's shoes. Well, that's what we're going to take a little bit of a look at today. Now, in 1921, uh, Franklin Roosevelt contracted polio and was unable to walk unassisted again. Some thought his career was over at that point. Uh, they believed that uh, the, the impact of the disease had left him too weak to um, physically weak, just too physically weak to uh, run a state to, or to run a country. But he proved them wrong. Uh, with his energy, his enthusiasm, and his sense of action. FDR probably even surprised himself a little bit uh, with his ability to uh, overcome the effects of, of polio and continue on with what it was that he wanted to do. He almost had an ability to push himself past physical problems such as health and disability. And this confidence may have been a little overemphasized uh, in the, the final months of his life, um, and we'll talk a little, 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 look at that as well here in a moment. Now, when FDR ran in 1932, he made every effort to downplay his disability. Everyone knew that he had polio, but most people didn't know to the extent that it had impacted him. And he wanted people talking about not what he couldn't do, but what he could do. And although he couldn't walk, he could run a country. 
And with all those accomplishments and the success, uh, the question of the president's health and his vitality uh, really sort of um, wasn't an issue in the first or second uh, terms. But by 1937, the first of the president's high blood pressure readings was taken. And uh, it wasn't uh, that bad, but um, it wasn't that good. And there was really nothing you could do about it. There were no statins back uh, in those days. So FDR just continued on and they kept a little look at it you know, every now and then. But since there was nothing they could do, there was really not too much time uh, or trouble to worry about it. Now FDR had planned to retire the presidency at the end of his second term as every president had done going back to George Washington. In fact, he even begun to build his presidential library um, in the end of, toward the end of his second term. But by 1939, he had two matters that concerned him. Number one was his New Deal legacy. Uh, who would protect it? Things like the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the National Recovery Administration were declared by the courts unconstitutional. And even Social Security uh, was kind of put on the block and, and barely got through. So he was worried about his domestic legacy, but he was also worried about Hitler and the problems that Hitler was causing uh, in Europe. One of the strange things of history is that Franklin Roosevelt comes to power and Adolf Hitler come to power within about six weeks of each other, and they die within six weeks of each other uh, as well. And President Roosevelt didn't think it would be a good time to be breaking in a new president especially with war looming uh, in Europe. Uh, and so he decided, well, maybe I need to run for a third term. And that's what he did in 1940. Now we were brought into the war, of course, on December 7th, 1941. And then at that point, we were off to the races. You know, we had a two front world war on our hands and a country largely unprepared, ranked somewhere between 14th and 17th behind Portugal in military strength. We had lots of catching up to do, and this meant long days, constant strain and pressure, and the fate of the world literally resting upon President Roosevelt's shoulders. Now, FDR was beginning to show some signs and symptoms of the wear and tear that a third term uh, would put on somebody, especially with a war about to take place uh, in Europe. But this was sort of seen as, all right, you know, to be expected given the situation. But by 1943, December, uh, Roosevelt had developed a persistent cough and some reoccurring fatigue. He just wasn't bouncing back the way he had. And uh, he was examined by his doctor, Dr. Uh, Ross McIntyre, and found to be in good overall health, all things being considered. This wasn't enough for his daughter, Anna. Anna insisted that he go in for more and thorough examinations. And off he went to the Bethesda Naval Hospital in March of 1944. And he was seen there by a young uh, cardiologist by the name of Dr. Howard uh, Bruin. Dr. Bruin discovered that uh, the president had reduced lung capacity, high blood pressure, acute bronchitis, and congestive heart failure. So he was sent to a pres uh, the president was sent to a friend's home in South Carolina for a long uh, month rest starting on April 8th, 1944. Now I wanna show you some of the documents here from that uh, report and you'll begin to get a sense of how bad things were. So here we see a copy of the report and this is FDR's blood pressure readings. And if you take a look at these, these are really starting to get pretty high up there. And um, Dr. Bruin is keeping a very close and careful watch on the president and making sure that uh, he's taking his blood pressure regularly and he's reporting this uh, as he begins to go. He prepares a report on the physical examination and he says this is a typical examination, temperature 98.6, pulse 72, respiration 20, lungs clear, heart um, has a, uh, an impulse and arterial uh, auxiliary line. The first sound of approximately is relatively good tone. Uh, A2 is greater than uh, P2. And he goes on to talk some more about things in, in medical terms. So basically he's beginning to get a baseline for what the president is going through and how the president is, uh, is doing. So I hear, hear the report from the US Naval Hospital and um, here the president is uh, being, uh, it's being laid out what he's going to do uh, and, the, and the kinds of things that he needs to um, uh, have done for him in order to regain his strength. 
So they're going to treat his respiratory problems with regular respiratory medicine at the time. They're trying to limit his activity to two hours in the morning, get an, uh, an hour of lying down in the late uh, morning, uh, early afternoon, and then another hour lying down later on in the afternoon, no swimming for the time being. And um, they want him to cut down on his, uh, his alcohol consumption and to uh, keep his bowels open to avoid effervescent laxatives and avoid straining uh, while going to the bathroom. So basically what the president's being told here is, you gotta take it easy. You gotta um, take care of yourself. Now this was great advice, but it was difficult to do. You know, when you're running a world war uh, for the uh, allies, um, you know, you don't have time to sit down. You don't have time to, to lay down, take a nap uh, two or three uh, times a day. So the president was given this uh, schedule and he tried to stick with it uh, as best he, uh, he could. Um, here was another, this is from May 5th, 1944. This is a copy of his daily schedule. And you can see he's gonna have uh, breakfast and then a couple of hours in the office. And then he's to lay down in his quarters, take a nap, rest, a couple more hours uh, in the office, and then uh, get 10 hours of sleep. And the sleep was uh, to be induced by sedative if necessary. So he really, uh, the doctors really wanted him to get uh, uh, his uh, sleep. As the president failed to really recuperate uh, and regain his strength, the restrictions on his um, activities became uh, more and more. And um, his, he had dietary restrictions to avoid all fried and greasy food, avoid smoked and cured fish and meat, avoid pastry, pie, and rich desserts, um, and uh, also uh, to use salt uh, sparingly uh, at the table. So this is the orders given to the cook on what to cook about uh, how FDR was uh, going to be prepared and uh, have his meals uh, and such. Now, everyone around the president could see that he was um, having some, some issues. He was having some, some difficulty. But um, the president himself said, all right, you know, I'm under doctor's care. I'll do the best I can uh, in terms of uh, taking care of myself. But there's only so much that I'm going to be able to, uh, to do. So he also had this other pressing thing, which was he had a fourth election to run. And so in September uh, of 1944, uh, the president rested up and gave a speech in front of the uh, Teamsters Union. And this came to be called the famous Fallas speech. And President Roosevelt uh, was trying to conserve his energy as he ran for um, uh, re-election. And um, he had to prove to people that he was up to the task for a fourth term. So when he gives this uh, Teamsters Union address, this is called the famous Fallas speech. And he's up there in front of this room full of Teamsters. It's being recorded for the newsreels. It's being recorded for the radio. And he says, you know, these Republicans are not intent with their attacks upon me, you know, but they're also attacking my family. Now, I don't resent attacks against me. And my family doesn't uh, re doesn't uh, resent tax again attacks against them, but now they've gone after my little dog Fala, and he does resent the attacks. And the idea was the Republicans had put out this um, rumor that Fala had been left on an illusion island while the president was going around looking at um, you know uh, military bases, and that they had to send back a destroyer at a cost of two or three or five or twenty million dollars to get Fala and bring him uh, back home. This was completely a rumor. This was completely untrue, as today we would call it fake news. And um, the president called it out for that, and uh, the Teamsters roared when they heard that, that uh, Fala did resent these and that his scotch soul was on fire and that he was quite angry about this. And what this did through the newsreels, through the radio, through the folks in the room, is it told people, hey, you know what? Roosevelt's back. The old Roosevelt's there. He's still got the spirit. He's still got the spunk. He's still got, uh, you know, the sense of humor. And this began to quell some uh, of those uh, those rumors. Now, the next month, uh, he was uh, going on a campaign swing through New York City, and um, the idea here was he was going to visit all of the boroughs of New York. So he went on a four-hour tour in a pouring, driving rain. And the idea of this was to show FDR, could 
you know, put up for this four hours in the driving rain. People were lining the streets, waving to him. He was driving in the car, waving. And, you know, occasionally they'd give him maybe a little nip, to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, get the color back, you know, get the color back in the cheeks. Uh, occasionally he would stop and, and switch in and change his clothes so that he wasn't sitting there the entire time uh, in the in the wet. But um, you can see here in this picture that this is a pretty rough uh, undertaking. Now the president there is, of course, uh, on the uh, on the side uh, oops, over here, and uh, he's sitting with some of the members of his staff. And there is a pouring rain. Now you can't see it in this picture, so we're going to do a little visual enhancement. And you could see that it was a stormy, cloudy day in New York, and the president drove around uh, in that rain for four hours. By the time they got home, the president uh, didn't even have so much as a sniffle. So many of the other folks that were with him that day uh, ended up coming down with colds. So this went a long way again to sort of quelch some of these rumors that the president was um, not up to the job. But in fact, at the same time that these uh, sort of you know uh, public events, these uh, I don't want to call them publicity stunts, but nonetheless, you know the, these uh, these uh, public actions that show him back in the game, he was in fact uh, slipping, and uh, those around him recognized it, and um, you know were quite uh, concerned uh, about it. Now there were a couple of theories that were going around about what was wrong with the president. One of them was that the president's polio had finally caught up to him, that uh, although it had settled in his legs, polio often would have other uh, residual effects on the body. And the fact that he had been pulling himself along uh, all those years, he was beginning to be run down uh, by the effects uh, of the polio. So that was one of the rumors. There was another rumor that the president had cancer. Uh, a melanoma had uh, appeared over his left eye and then uh, was later removed. He had it from 1932 to um, 1944, and then he had it removed. And the idea was this melanoma had metastasized into uh, his brain, and that is what had caused uh, the stroke. There was also a rumor that he had stomach cancer. Uh, he wasn't able to keep his food down, and then maybe this was a, a situation as well. There was even rumors uh, shortly after the president died, that perhaps Stalin's cook had poisoned FDR at Yalta. Now, there was no evidence of this, of course, but uh, very often when you know a public speaker, speak, uh, public figure, or public speaker is struck down like that, you know these conspiracies come up because people are looking for an answer. How could this possibly have happened? Closer to the facts was the fact that the president had heart trouble and he had severe high uh, blood pressure. Um, and this seems to be the most likely uh, uh, reason for the president's dwindling health because his father had died of a heart attack and heart disease. Uh, he was stressed out from the war and the 12 years of, of being president, first with the Great Depression and then, of course, the Second World War. He smoked too much. He got very little exercise and very little sleep and was under constant pressure and stress of trying to win the war. So it's really no wonder uh, you know, that he died as young as he did. The president was only 63 years old when he died. And the older uh, you get, um, the younger that is. And so um, he uh, lasted throughout this term uh, as long as he could. It's kind of a wonder that he didn't die uh, sooner. Now, in the late afternoon uh, of uh, April 12th, 1945, a news flash went out. It said, Flash, Washington, FDR dead. Short, curt, precise. Soon the radio was carrying the, the, uh, the additional news about this. Oddly, America's children were the first to hear the news. The uh, news broke late in the afternoon. And the late afternoon on radio was the radio children's hour. And there was a lot of children's uh, programming. The children had come home from school. They were seated there uh, listening to their favorite radio shows. On NBC, they were listening to Front Page Feral. On CBS, Wilderness Road. On ABC, Captain Midnight. And on Mutual, uh, Tom Mix. So the parents uh, were sort of the second to know. The kids were disgruntled that the radio shows were being disrupted. Something happened to the president. And then uh, the rest of the afternoon, people sat glued to their radios, um, listening for more uh, information.
And of course, the next day, headlines like the one behind me uh, went out all across uh, the country and all across the world. Now, for most folks, this was a complete and total shock. People couldn't remember a time when President Roosevelt had not been president. In London, Churchill was up late in his study, and he said when he heard the news, he felt as if he had experienced a uh, physical blow. That's how bad uh, it was for him. In Moscow, Foreign Minister Molotov visited the American ambassador in the middle of the night, uh, Ambassador Harriman, uh, to convey the shock that Stalin was feeling. In Berlin, uh, the phone rang at Hitler's headquarters, and it was none other than propaganda minister uh, Joseph Goebbels, who was ecstatic over hearing the news, and he couldn't wait to tell the Fuhrer what had happened. Uh, it's reported that Hitler saw this as the miracle he had been hoping for. He um, uh, thought that if FDR died, uh, Truman would be weak, and that Hitler would be able to sue for peace in a way that kept himself uh, in power. Of course, this was not to occur. In Washington, Mrs. Roosevelt had been spared some of the shock uh, by uh, first being told that the president had had a fainting spell earlier in the afternoon, and then later in the afternoon, the definitive call came that the president uh, had passed away. Somewhere in Europe, Generals Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton sat up all night in a trailer and talked about what this could mean for the war effort. Meanwhile, in Washington, Harry S. Truman, the vice president, had uh, just completed a letter home to his mother and to his sister, and the session for the day had uh, wrapped up there in the Senate, as you probably know, the vice president is the president of the Senate, and so he, uh, the session had wrapped up, he had gone over to the um, uh, House Speaker's office, Sam Rayburn, uh, for an afternoon libation, which was uh, sort of a an ongoing occurrence in the afternoon after work was over. When he arrived at uh, the Rayburn office, uh, there was a message waiting for him there that the White House had called and that if anybody had seen the vice president, uh, they were to instruct him to call the White House immediately. So uh, Truman poured himself a drink, picked up the uh, phone, was connected to the White House switchboard, and he was connected to Steve Early, the president's press secretary, who instructed him to get over to the White House quickly and quietly and instructed him as to which entrance he was to take. Now Truman knew something was up, uh, but he had no idea this could possibly have happened. Even though the people around the president saw the president's health deteriorating, they had seen him back, uh, bounce back again uh, time and time again. And there was almost this um, self-deception led by Roosevelt himself. Uh, very often, he wouldn't want to know what the diagnosis was. He wouldn't ask the, the doctors what his blood pressure readings were. He just figured, all right, you guys are taking care of that. I'll take care of what I can take care of. He didn't really want to know uh, what was wrong with him. And the folks around him certainly weren't going to um, you know, lift the veil on that uh, either. So uh, Truman goes to the White House, he's taken upstairs to the uh, study, and uh, there he sees Mrs. Roosevelt and members of the uh, Roosevelt administration. She walks over, she puts her arm on his shoulder, and she says, Harry, the president is dead. And of course, shock, momentary shock. And he uh, collects himself and he says, Mrs. Roosevelt, is there anything I can do for you? And she says, is there anything we can do for you? You're the one in trouble now. And that's how it happened uh, there uh, in uh, the White House. So just what happened that morning in Warm Springs, Georgia? Well, FDR had gone to Warm Springs uh, to rest up. He had just returned from a 40,000 plus mile journey to Yalta to meet with uh, Churchill uh, and Stalin about the impending victory that the Allies expected to happen uh, very shortly in the next coming weeks or possibly um, the next couple of months. And um, they were gonna talk about uh, how to conclude the war and then how to create the new world order for uh, the post-war period. There was a great deal of uh, tension among the Grand Alliance. Um, having a common enemy such as Hitler and the Axis powers had brought the Allies close together, but had brought them together somewhat artificially. What you actually had was Roosevelt, who led a democracy, Churchill, who led an empire, and Stalin, who led a dictatorship. 
so these were not exactly um, you know, uh, concurrent uh, types of, of administrations. And so um, they had to work out the differences, which were beginning to boil up to the surface now that um, the, um, uh, the alliance uh, was getting near winning the war and they no longer had uh, this common uh, enemy. Now, Roosevelt's main goal at this time uh, was uh, at, for this conference at Yalta, his main goal was to get Stalin to buy in to support the United Nations, uh, to establish a world body, a world um, organization that could prevent a third world war. And this was Roosevelt's dream, to create the United Nations. And it goes back to um, his time with President Wilson. President Wilson was a personal political hero uh, of, of FDR. In fact, FDR was the man who placed Wilson's name and nomination uh, for the presidency. And when uh, um, Woodrow Wilson won the presidency. He appointed FDR to be Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And Wilson had this idea after the First World War of a League of Nations, of a world body that could get together and talk about differences and prevent uh, another world war. And um, the League of Nations was a tremendous failure. Uh, the United States failed to join. The Senate wouldn't let us join. And so uh, there was no uh, American leadership. Um, there was no mechanism for getting uh, things done. It was just sort of this club of nations. Um, there were few clear objectives as to what a League of Nations would actually do other than try to uh, prevent uh, conflict. And the League of Nations oversold what it was about to be able to try to do. Um, you know, World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars, the Great War. And so uh, the League of Nations was supposed to prevent these things from happening again. And of course, this wasn't um, what the League of Nations was able to do. So FDR had this goal of bringing about this world body to sort of carry on the legacy of his personal uh, uh, political mentor, uh, Woodrow Wilson. But Roosevelt also understood something very important. The First World War, 16 million people perished. The Great War, the war to end all wars. World War II, 60 million people perished. FDR had been the Assistant Secretary of the Navy during the First World War. Now he was Commander in Chief during the Second World War. And Roosevelt understood that if there was a Third World War, hundreds of millions of people would be killed. Don't forget, Roosevelt knew that we were building an atomic bomb. And he knew that in the Third World War, atomic bombs would be on the scene. And if they were used, hundreds of millions of people would uh, perish. And so Roosevelt was trying to uh, prevent a third world war uh, from occurring. Now he'd been thinking about this way back um, early on in his uh, administration. So let me show you a couple of documents uh, for that. Uh, shortly after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor um, in uh, January of 1942, Roosevelt called a meeting to the White House. And he said, hey, all you nations that want to be united against the Nazis, united against Hitler and the Axis powers, come to the White House, we'll sign a treaty, we'll start an alliance, and we'll beat these guys. And so what happened was they came to the White House and they produced uh, this list, this document. And so this becomes the beginning of United Nations. Now, what's interesting about this is uh, up here uh, in the corner, you've got what Roosevelt is thinking of as the four policemen, the United States, the United Kingdom, USSR, and China. So Roosevelt says, okay, we're gonna win this war, we're gonna you know, beat these guys, and when we do, this, oops, this will become the four policemen that will keep peace in the world uh, after that. Now you may also notice these crazy lines on here. You know, what are those all about? Well, if you look carefully, it says the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And beneath that says Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and India. So these countries here are the colonies of England. Had it been 1774 when this document was created, the United States would be under here as well. So what Roosevelt does is he sees this and he says, wait a minute, we're not fighting this war for the British Empire. We're fighting this war to create democracies, strong, safe, democracies that can be a bulwark against the um, uh, fascism and the Nazism and dictators that want to um, 
uh, take over uh, countries and take over regions. So he wants to create strong, safe democracies. So he takes his pencil and he puts these in alphabetical order where they should be uh, in the world. Now, Winston Churchill was not too happy about that, but what could he do? He needed Roosevelt's help and support. So this list of United Nations is created in 1942, just weeks after uh, the attack at Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt is thinking not just of the war, but beyond the war uh, as well. These are the thoughts that are going on in his mind uh, in the final years of his life, the final months of his life, the final days of his life. Well, at the Tehran conference of the big three, FDR uh, is sitting there and he's doodling. And he comes up with this sketch. And this sketch is actually the structure for the United Nations. So you have uh, over here 40 United Nations, an executive committee, and the four policemen that I just showed you on that other document. Roosevelt knew there needed to be a structure because that was one of the problems with the League of Nations no real structure. He also wanted there to be a list of things that these the United Nations would do, because again, the League of Nations was unclear about what its task was. So Roosevelt has here an ILO, an international labor organization, a health organization, and an agriculture and food organization. And he understands and believes that if the United Nations can bring jobs to people, can bring healthy environments to people, and can feed people, this will go a long way to resolving conflict in the world. And this is by FDR at Tehran, November 30th, 1943. So this obsession, this idea, this goal, this dream of the United Nations is haunting uh, FDR uh, as he begins to move into uh, the fourth term. Now, um, why did he run for a fourth term? Well, his critics claimed it was because of arrogance and ego, right, that he just loved being president, wanted to stay president, couldn't uh, bear to give up the, uh, the power. Some said that he was in denial over his uh, failing health and thought he would live forever, and so he might as well have this job uh, for another bunch of years. Some said it was a sense of duty uh, to finish the job that had been started or to finish the job that he'd been thrust into uh, with the World War. And others said it was a love for humanity and desire to save the world from future suffering. And I think it was probably a combination of those last three. Denial that his health was failing, uh, a sense of duty that the job had to be completed and be done, and a love of humanity and a desire to prevent more suffering to create this, um, this United Nations. I think that in a lot of ways, Roosevelt felt that he had no choice. If he didn't run, the presidency would have gone probably to uh, Henry Wallace, who would have been probably the Democratic nominee, having been uh, vice president. Or if he didn't win, it would have gone to Thomas Dewey. And Roosevelt saw neither of those two as a particularly good uh, follow-up to what he had uh, planned there for the war. So if he didn't run, the presidency would go to one of those two. If he did run, uh, he could tie up the war and um, work to get the United Nations established, which would then end in one of three ways. Either he would live long enough to pull both of those things off, win the war and create the United Nations, or he could resign if the stress got to be too much for him before he had a big, was able to accomplish this, but push as far as he could to create as, as much as he could. Or the third option, he could die trying. And ultimately that's what happened. Uh, he died trying to bring about the end of the war and create uh, the United Nations. So FDR uh, was exhausted, so much so that uh, prior to leaving Washington, he addressed Congress uh, in the well of the Congress from a seated position, the first time he had ever done that in 12 years as president. And it was also the first time he admitted that he wasn't able to stand and that he had this physical disability that required him to walk around with 10 pounds of steel on his legs. Again, everyone knew that he had had polio, but he tried to downplay the effects of that uh, as much as he could. So on the morning of April 12th, um, and that rolls around, the president woke up 
in Warm Springs, Georgia. He, after he finishes his speech, he goes down to Warm Springs, Georgia to regain his strength. The morning of April 12th, uh, he's down there. He wakes up around nine o'clock. He has a slight headache and some stiffness in his shoulder, uh, but that's able to be uh, removed by a little uh, light massage. He had a pretty good breakfast by the standards of his eating habits at that time. Uh, a little bowl of gruel, some coffee, some nibbles on some toast and, uh, and some fruit. And he got dressed and was in good spirits um, throughout the morning. In fact, people who met with him that morning said that he looked really good, that he was starting to get his color back. And we now understand that that was probably the beginning of the stroke, that uh, you know, the blood was beginning to, um, you know, to sort of uh, you know, collect and, and stay. He settled into a chair in the living room of the uh, cottage and he was being sketched uh, by a artist um, owned by the name of Madame Schumatoff. And he was uh, sitting there with um, his secretary, Grace Tully, uh, Grace Tully rather, uh, two cousins, Polly Delano and Daisy Sukley, and also Lucy Rutherford. Yes, that Lucy Russell Rutherford, the woman that he'd had an affair with way back during the First World War and that he promised he would never see again. So what happened was uh, his own daughter, Anna, had reconnected the two and um, they had begun to see each other yet again. And she was there in Warm Springs, Georgia. Now, I want to share with you um, this picture. This picture is the last picture taken of Franklin Roosevelt. It was taken the day before he passed away. And you can see that uh, his clothes no longer are fitting him, right? You know, his, his, uh, there's too much around here in the cuffs and in the collar. You can see how dark the circles are under his eyes, the lines in his face. These pictures were taken so that Madame Shumatov could use them to create the portrait of the president. And she used these pictures to ultimately create the what's called unfinished portrait of President Roosevelt. So this is what he was looking like in actuality. And this is what she was painting him to look like. She was picking up quite a bit of the detail, right? The dark color, uh, the circles under the eyes, the lines on the face, but he certainly looks better in the portrait than he does uh, in the um, picture. Now, Roosevelt's last official act was uh, to approve a design for a stamp for the United Nations, uh, towards a United Nations. It was going to be a stamp uh, that was going to be issued at the opening of the United Nations on April 25th, later that month, and it was going to be given to the uh, delegation uh, of the various countries that attended, and um, that was going to commemorate the, the opening of the United Nations session. And this was his last official act was to uh, approve that um, approve that uh, that collection uh, or that stamp for the um, for the convention. And we know that because we have an official letter from the Postmaster General asking which of the four or five designs the president would like to have. And we have a letter coming back to him from one of his uh, secretaries, uh, William D. Uh, Hassert, who uh, is sending back saying that the president uh, would confirm the blue stamp um, because blue was an international color and it was also a good color for uh, the United Nations. And so that was his last official uh, act. President was sitting there around one o'clock. He said, we've got about 15 minutes of work left to go. And um, he continued to work on some papers. About 15 minutes later, he slumped forward. Uh, he said uh, he slumped forward and uh, Daisy Sukley, who was sitting with him, thought he had dropped something. So she said, Are you, everything all right? And he said, I have a tremendous headache. And he put his hand to the back of his head and shortly thereafter, he lost consciousness. <clears throat> He was picked up and carried into the bedroom uh, of the cottage, and by 1.35, uh, uh, he was uh, described as pale, cold, and sweating profusely. And I happen to have here um, the final reports uh, of uh, his doctor about what was going on in the final moments of the president's life, and I'd like to share those uh, with you. So it says this morning, uh, the president was seen at 9.20, a few minutes after he had awakened and he slept well, but complained of a slight headache and some stiffness of the neck. 
He ascribed this uh, to a soreness of the muscles and relief was experienced with slight massage. He had a very good morning and his guests commented upon the fact of how well he looked. He was sitting in a chair as the subject of some sketches which were being done uh, by an artist when he suddenly complained of a terrific headache and became unconscious within a minute or two later. So this is uh, going on the morning of April 12th, 1945. Between 1.30 and 2.30, as we can see over here, the doctor uh, writes, um, then uh, seen 15 minutes later, he was pale, cold, and sweating profusely. He was totally unconscious with fairly frequent uh, contractions of a mild degree. Pupils of the eyes were at first equal, but in a few minutes, the left pupil became widely dilated. The lungs were clear, but he was breathing strenuously, but regularly. Heart sounds were excellent. Heart rate 96 times per minute. Blood pressure, systolic, was well over 300, and the diastolic was 190. Um, the, uh, the president uh, was cold to the touch and therefore uh, warmth in the form of hot water bottles and blankets was applied and he was given a shot of adrenaline uh, in his heart. By 2.45, color uh, was much improved. Breathing was a little irregular and strenuous, but he was breathing deeply. At this point, the blood pressure had fallen to 240 over 120. The heart was still sounding good and beating at 90 beats per minute. By 315, uh, the blood pressure was 219 over 110, heart rate 96. The right pupil was still widely dilated, but the left pupil uh, was moderately constricted and uh, had become moderately dilated. Um, occasional spasms of rigidity were, uh, were uh, marked in his respiration, and during the later phases, uh, he began uh, to struggle. <clears throat> By 3.30, pupils were now approximately equal. Breathing became irregular, but of good amplitude. By 3.31, just one minute later, breathing suddenly stopped and was replaced by occasional gasps. Heart sounds were not audible. Artificial respiration was begun and um, adrenaline was again ministered to the heart muscle. And at 3.35, the president was pronounced dead. Lucy Rutherford was packed up, sent out, and uh, back to uh, South Carolina, and uh, a phone call was placed to the, uh, to the White House um, telling Mrs. Roosevelt uh, first that the president had fainted and then the president had passed. Mrs. Roosevelt wanted to immediately get to Warm Springs, and she wondered if she was still eligible to fly on a government plane now that the president had passed. And of course, President Truman said, absolutely, get on that plane and get down there. So in Warm Springs, Georgia, the uh, president was, um, was taken. And uh, here is his death certificate. This is a, you know, sort of a uh, photostatic copy. And what's interesting about this is it lists the cause of death as a cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, it lists the uh, occupation, um, regular occupation, as president of the United States, and it lists where the president was born, where he died, who his parents were, um, and that is the official record of the president passing. There was no autopsy performed on the president at Mrs. Roosevelt's uh, request, and the president um, was then um, placed in a, uh, a coffin and in a casket, and he was taken to the railroad station. Uh, the fellow uh, folks, his fellow uh, polio um, victims and survivors were there, and they bid him farewell, and people were just shocked. Here is a grown man, a United States Naval officer, brought to tears as he plays uh, the accordion, um, and he, the song he was playing was Going Home. Ordinary folks also could not believe the news. They were devastated that the president had uh, passed uh, away. The president's body was loaded onto the train. Ordinarily, uh, he would have, um, here it is, being taken to the, uh, to the station in Warm Springs, Georgia. And you can see the people there uh, gathering around, uh, some of his fellow polio victims, some of the members of, of the military. <clears throat> 
ordinarily he would have been riding in the Ferdinand Magellan, his specially armored car uh, that he traveled in. But because the car was specially armored and had three inch thick glass windows, uh, the windows were not able to be removed and they couldn't get the uh, casket on through the door. So the president was placed in a, another car and he was attended to by an honor guard of military personnel all the way back uh, to Washington. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt laid awake that night in her berth, looking out uh, onto the crowds, and there was almost continual line of well-wishers uh, all the way from Warm Springs up to Washington, D.C. The president's casket was brought into Union Station, and um, a parade was formed, a, a military parade, from Union Station back to the White House. And again, tens of thousands of people lined along the streets to see the president's casket uh, go by. Now, the president um, and Mrs. Roosevelt did not like the tradition of laying in state. So the president was bought, brought back to the, uh, to the White House and he was placed in the East Room um, for approximately five hours while uh, members of the, the, of the Roosevelt administration and, and uh, you know, dignitaries in Washington came to the White House uh, and paid their respect. Hundreds of people passed uh, the casket in the East Room. Thousands more gathered outside the gates, uh, outside the White House. Now, interestingly enough, um, years, uh, quite a time later, not years later, but uh, later after the president's uh, funeral, an envelope was found in his safe um, which gave specific instructions on the way he wanted his funeral uh, carried out. Unfortunately, this was not found in time, uh, this document, it's handwritten, and it was not found in time to be used for the funeral. But Mrs. Roosevelt knew the president's wishes so well that many of the things that were in this document were actually uh, adhered to in the funeral procession. The president was... Um, like I say, uh, laid out in the East Room. Hundreds of uh, people came through and um, a small brief uh, ceremony was administered uh, there in the East Room. Angus Dunn, the Episcopal minister, uh, excuse me, the Episcopal bishop of the Diocese of Washington, D.C., was brought in to perform a short ceremony. And at his request, at the request of Mrs. Roosevelt, he he asked her, she asked him to say something about um, fear and banishing fear and not to be fearful. And so um, Angus Dunn put together um, the following statement. He said, in his first inaugural address, the president bore testimony of his own deep faith, saying, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. As that was his, his first word to us, I am sure he would wish it to be his last words. That is, that we go forward to the tasks in which he led us. We shall go forward without fear of the future, without fear for our allies, without fear for our friends, and without fear of our own insufficiency. 25 minute service, and the president was then um, taken back by train um, to, um, to Washington, D.C. Now, meanwhile, in Washington, of course, President, uh, the new president, President Truman, um, was meeting with the cabinet and he asked them all to stay on and uh, continue on working uh, until he had a chance to get his land legs and to figure out what it was that he was going to do. He was pledging to support of Roosevelt and he wanted the, the uh, administration, the cabinet to follow along with him. After the meeting, Secretary Stimson uh, held back and said, uh, Mr. Uh, Truman, can I have a minute with you when you get a minute? And of course, uh, he said, I have something very important that I need to talk with you about. And that was the development of the atomic bomb. Now that minute that he wanted with President Truman didn't take place for almost two weeks. It was almost two weeks later that uh, they got together and uh, uh, he was told of the atomic bomb. Two days into his presidency, uh, President Truman had uh, appointed um, a gentleman by the name of John Schneider to uh, be a federal loan officer. And when he called over to the uh, administration uh, office that was handling the loan administrations, the uh, person on the phone said, did the president make that decision before he died? <laughs> 
And Truman said, no, he made it just now. That's how shocked people were. Even two or three days into it, they still couldn't believe that Roosevelt uh, had passed away. Now, I'm often struck by President Roosevelt's first words to the nation when he said, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And um, very inspiring words. And if you compare those to Truman's, some of Truman's first words as president, he said to the a group of press reporters, he said, I don't know if you boys ever had a load of hay fall on you. But when I was told yesterday that I was president and that President Roosevelt was dead, I felt like the stars, the moon, and the sun all fell upon me. I don't know if you pray for anyone, but if you do, pray for me now. Now, the train uh, came back from um, Warm Springs, uh, Georgia, and it was uh, uh, came back at 30 miles an hour in honor of the president. The president always liked this train to go no more than 30 miles per hour because with the polio, he would be shuffled around uh, on the train if it went uh, too quickly. And he was laid to rest uh, here on April 15th uh, in the Rose Garden of his home. And here is a picture of that ceremony. Um, dignitaries uh, were there. And of course, um, the military uh, sent the uh, cadets from the military academy at West Point up to officiate and to uh, play taps and to um, give the president a 21 gun salute. The president was buried um, east to west with his uh, head um, to the west and his feet to the east so that he could uh, see the sun come up and go across the day uh, for all of eternity. And here is Mrs. Roosevelt and Anna at the funeral there as well. So FDR's final year, his final months, his final days were a race against time, a battle to live long enough to bring about the victory over the Nazis and the Axis powers, and then also to establish a world organization that could bring about not just the victory, but the peace in the world after the victory. And he did both of those things. Though he never quite lived to see them, he had laid the foundation and brought those about. And so I'd like to say here on this 78th anniversary of the president's passing, thank you, President Roosevelt, for giving your life in the service and pursuit of a lasting world peace. We can open it up to some questions and, and answers. And let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Okie dokie. Uh, blood pressure is crazy high. Yes, indeed. That's Paul Sparrow, our former director. Hey, Paul. Uh, FDR appeared uh, indefeatable at least at the outside. Um, okay, great. Yeah, he uh, you know he was able to to put on that act really, or to, to muster that strength to be able to pull that uh, together. President Roosevelt was the best president ever. Can't argue with that. Uh, now they have medicine to treat high blood pressure. Yeah, in fact, uh, Dr. Bruin later said, he, he uh, wrote a, a little uh, essay about 10 years after the president died. And he said that if the president had undergone these situations just 10 years later, um, he would have been, the, the condition of the high blood pressure at least, could certainly have been um, treated uh, quite easily with medication. Um, you know, some of the other uh, ailments that were, uh, you know, the congestive heart failure and such could have been uh, somewhat treated, but um, it was pretty um, hard moving along. In fact, uh, when the president was embalmed, the undertaker said that uh, the president's veins were so clogged that it was difficult to get the embalming fluid uh, to go uh, to go through. Uh, see, I enjoyed the visit uh, to the library. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. People saying well done. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate um, you, know, you folks uh, spending some time with us here uh, to, um, to learn about the Roosevelt's, um, not just on this very sort of sad and solemn day, uh, but also a day of, of um, you know, of hope, a day of, 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 uh, of looking forward, because that's what the president always was doing. And so, um, you know, were he still alive, of course, he would want us to continue on that work. It's up to us to continue that work. We are the cogs in the Roosevelt wheel.
and it looks like we're not getting any more questions uh, coming in. So with that, I will leave you to contemplate the work of the late, great President Roosevelt. And we will see you all here in Hyde Park next time you're around. So please come and visit. We'll see you here through the technology next time around as well. Bye-bye.